So we were talking about subspaces. I mean, we introduced vector spaces. And then we said, well, if we have a set inside of a vector space, it inherits most of the vector space properties automatically. Like for any vectors u and v in the subspace, u plus v is going to equal v plus u because these vectors are also vectors in the bigger space and the bigger space has that property. We said that for a subset of a vector space to be a vector space, it needs two properties or three properties, depending on, I guess, how you number them. It needs closure properties. Closure under addition and scalar multiplication and zero. Let's call this subspace W. W has to include zero, the zero vector. Um so for the most part, we are going to be looking at subspaces of Rn. So we're going to still be in the column vector case. Uh, one other vector space that we're going to occasionally come back to, just because it gives such a nice illustration of some algebra properties, is what we'll call P sub N. This vector space is all polynomials of degree less than or equal to N plus the constant zero polynomial. And I've called this a vector space already. And this is definitely a vector space um, for the, I mean, for the following reason. P sub n is contained in the function space. A polynomial is a special kind of function. So for this to be a subspace, it only needs three properties. And let's go through them. It needs closure under addition. So when you add two polynomials together, the result is certainly a polynomial. Um, and adding two polynomials can decrease their degree, like negative x plus one and positive x minus two. Those are first degree polynomials. You put them together, the x's cancel, you get a degree zero polynomial. So we do. I mean, you might see P sub N, and you might think, well, we should be looking at polynomials of some fixed degree. That doesn't work. We don't have closure 
if we try to define P sub n this way. Um, but adding two polynomials together will never uh, increase their degree. I mean, the degree of that sum is going to be a, either stuff's going to cancel and the degrees will shrink, or it will be the largest degree in the sum. So if we have two polynomials whose degree is smaller than n, um, less than or equal to n, I should say, their sum is going to be less than or equal to n. A polynomial times a constant is still a polynomial. In fact, multiplying by a constant doesn't change the degree unless the constant happens to be zero, in which case you get the zero polynomial. And we've added, I mean, the zero polynomial is here. So either the degree doesn't change, the degree doesn't increase, or we get the zero polynomial. So scalar multiplication is fine. And then we have included the zero polynomial by special fiat. And that's just because nobody can seem to quite agree what the degree um, what the degree of the zero polynomial is, or if the zero polynomial should e even have a degree. I mean, ordinarily, a constant polynomial has degree zero, but, but the zero polynomial is weak. If you say it has degree zero, then some of your degree rules start to break down. So people say, well, maybe it has a degree of negative infinity, or maybe it has a degree of negative one, or maybe we should just say it doesn't have a degree. And we are gracefully sidestepping this entire mess by just saying we're going to include it in this list and we don't care what its degree is. So here's a classic example of a subspace. Well, subspaces are vector spaces. So, I mean, really, this is a classic example of a vector space. We'll come back to it uh, on and off throughout the class. Continuing to talk about subspaces, if we have a vector space V, this has some generic sub spaces. And these mostly aren't very interesting. Um, but what I mean by generic is like the polynomial vector space is a subspace of the of functions, of the space of functions. And obviously it's kind of a special subspace and it's unique to the space of functions. I mean, you can't take you can't take the vector space of column vectors and have the polynomials as a subspace of that. On the other hand, I mean, every this is again not very interesting, but every vector space has zero as a subspace. And every vector space is a subspace of itself. And let me separate this off because it's less inane and more important. Spans. 
Oh, vectors are always subspaces. That is to say, if you have some vectors, V1, V2, up to Vn, and you define their span in the natural way, the same way that we defined the span when we were working with column vectors then this is always going to be a subspace. Um, as a matter of fact, that's another way of looking at, at the polynomials. You can say that in the function space, the polynomials are the span of one x, x squared, x cubed, up the x to the nth power. Now, this is linear algebra, and we're mostly, as I say, going to be talking about Rn. So let's sort of move from the generic to the specific. And let's say we've got some matrix A. Some we're no longer in the inverse section. We no longer need all our matrices to be square. Matrix. I think I was starting to spell matrices, but we've just got one of them. So here's a matrix. We're going to use this matrix to define two special vector spaces subspaces of either Rn or Rm. We'll start with the null space. And the null space of a matrix is all of the vectors V, such that A times V equals zero. So here's a situation where it's like I say, oh, the zero vector is always a subspace. It's not a very interesting subspace, but in a one sense, it's important because for a lot of matrices, this null space is just going to contain one vector. For a lot of matrices, the only solution to this is going to be the zero vector. And because we know the zero vector is a vector space, that doesn't uh, bother us. Um, we could prove that that the null space of a vector is a vector space. In fact, it will probably take like three to five minutes. So why don't we? Should be closed under addition. So let's look at two vectors. I, this is our notation. I absolutely hate it. I feel like you are not saving a lot of time by spelling null, N-U-L, and I always forget, uh, but, but it's, it's written like that with one L. So say that V and W are in the null space, So a v is zero and a w is zero. 
then we want this to be closed under addition. So we want V plus W to be in the null space. And well, we... Multiplication distributes over addition. A V is zero, A W is zero. So A times V plus W is indeed zero, and V plus W is therefore in the null space. Um, scalar multiplication. So that's just take one of these vectors in the null space V, and let's multiply it by a scalar. And now let's multiply it by A. And we want to get zero, and here's where we keep writing these facts down that we can move scalars around. We don't seem to be doing much with those facts, but here's an application. That scalar A can go outside of the parentheses. Now we have alpha times the zero vector, and that is the zero vector. And almost going without saying, zero is supposed to be there, and it certainly is. A times zero equals zero. So we can find no spaces of matrices. This is a uh, um, there was a thing on the test where I asked you to do this, although I didn't, uh, of course, say the word phrase, no space, but I gave you a matrix and I said, um, solve AX equals zero. So let's remind ourselves. One, two, four, seven, six, three, two, eight. And let's state our goal. Find the null space of A. So we, we solve AX equals zero which we do by augmenting the zero vector. And now we'll go to our, well, first we'll load the thing. Okay, so this is uh, two by five, and that's one, two, four, seven, zero, if I am remembering that, and six, three, two, eight, zero. So we'll quit out. We'll perform our our R R E F doing my C O impression. Uh, there's this. It looks absolutely 
or four, but maybe if we make it as a fraction, it will be a little nicer looking. Uh, I guess not the nicest fractions, but one zero, negative eight nine, negative five nine, zero. Uh, zero, one, two, nine, thirty, four, nine, zero. And let's remember how this works. Uh, our no space is going to be a linear combination of some vector. So when we have an augmented matrix like this, the columns are going to give us variables, except for the last column, which is going to give us equality. And then we read from the to write, and I don't think anyone really had problems with this. I think on the test, uh, some people didn't notice the equal zero and didn't, uh, didn't add that last column, but x1, and now maybe we can do a little of this in our head, x1 minus 8 ninths x3 minus 5 ninths x. What, what do you say for like a minute? It's probably best to, to just write everything down, at least when you're teaching the material. x2 plus 22 ninths x3 plus 34 ninths x4 equals zero. And then there was some confusion where to go from, from here. So let's remind ourselves we're going to get our Our three variables, which are x3 and x4, there is no pivot position in either of those columns. We're going to get our three variables over to the right. So we'll add both, we'll add this stuff to the zero on the right, and we'll get x1. equals eight ninths x three plus five ninths x four x two negative twenty two ninths x three And negative thirty four ninths x four and then and I think this is where we lost some people on the test, but we need an equation for all of the variables. So for x three, now, x3 is one plus times itself, and zero times x4, and x4 is one times x4, and zero times x3.
and so if we wanted to x equals eight ninths negative twenty two ninths one zero times a free variable x three plus five ninths negative thirty four ninths zero one times a free variable x four. Um, another way of writing this would be that x is the span of two vectors. Let's rephrase that. The no space of A is the span of two vectors. It's negative 22 ninths. One zero and Five negative thirty four So no spaces are spans and um that's that's true for every matrix A. I mean, the numbers I came up with off the top of my head did not have magic powers that make this true. Um, uh, I mean, the, the trivial vector space zero is the span of the zero vector. So even when there's only one solution, it's true that the null space of a matrix is a span of some vectors. For the moment, this is just going to be kind of an unmotivated aside, but notice that these uh, vectors are linearly independent. And we know that they're linearly independent because of the zeros. Um, when you have two vectors in a set to be dependent, one has to be a multiple of the other. But the second can't be a multiple of the first because any multiple of the first will still have a zero down here. And uh, the first can't be a multiple of the second for a similar reason. Um, as a matter of fact, this process is always going to give you linearly independent effects. And I'm saying that because it's going to be important. I think in the very next section, we'll talk about why we would want sets of vectors to be linearly independent. That's one of two subspaces or yeah, subspaces that we're going to uh, talk about today. At, at some point, without warning, we actually switched textbook sections. Um, so the span and P sub N, these early few frames were still 4.1. And then when we defined the null space, we entered 4.2. The other vector space that gets talked about in 4.2 is 
the column space. of A and the column space of A call A is the span of its column as pretty uh pretty simple definition Going back to here, we found the null space let's find the column space, and I have no no terror that we're going to run out of room here. The column space of A is the span of its columns. So the span of one six, the span of two three, four two, and seven eight. So Defining column spaces and finding column spaces is the easiest thing in the world. Although notice that those four vectors aren't linearly independent. They can't be linearly independent. Why not? Why aren't they linearly independent? It's a one sentence argument. These are vectors in R2. Because there's more than two of them. Because there's more than two of them. Um, more than n vectors in Rn is always going to be dependent. So in one sense, this is very easy. Uh, in another sense, if we are going to care about linear independence, we uh, it seems like we still have some work to do, but that work is going to be put off until um, until the next section. And man, we just blew through this section, but with my online students, I don't want to suddenly post a new section. I guess before, before we dismiss, I'll say a few things. The null space and the column space always get presented together. But notice that there are subspaces of different vector spaces. So here A is two by four, and the column space is a subspace of R2, whereas the null space those vectors had four entries in them, so the null space is in R4. So they are presented together, but there's a pretty fundamental difference between them. They live in entirely different spaces. Um, the null space Let's use the null space for something. Um, let's call this a 
theorem. It's not stated exactly like this in the textbook, but the textbook does do examples like this. Um, a set defined by linear combinations. And I mean, this is just going to read like gibberish, but I hope when we do an example, it will be clearer by linear combinations of entries of a vector is a vector space. What I mean by that is that you sometimes get these situations where like you have a vector and you're told no that there are relationships that have to be satisfied within this vector. A plus B has to equal C, B minus D has to equal A or whatever. So if we look at all of the vectors that satisfy this, this is a plus b minus c equals zero. And this is negative a plus b. Here we don't have any d condition. And we can add a zero D and we can add a zero C. So these requirements that the various entries of the vector are required to have can be rewritten as a system of matrix of linear equations and more to the point, a homogeneous system of linear equations. You see, we brought everything over to the right. So we have zeros on the left. This then can be rewritten as one, one, negative one, zero, negative one, one, zero, negative one, times A, B, C, D, equals the zero vectors. That is to say that the set of vectors that satisfy these requirements is the null space of this matrix. And because um, the null space of a matrix is a vector space. Um, that tells you the this, this set of vectors that satisfy all of this is a vector space. And then that tells you some stuff. Um, here's, I don't think it's a theorem in the textbook, but it's, it's absolutely a true statement that a vector space 
with more than gosh, this is such an ugly way to say this. The, the fancy way of saying this would just be a non-trivial vector space. A vector space that isn't just the zero vector. So a non-trivial vector space is always infinite. So, you know, we can now look at these requirements and we can now say, well, if we can find any values of A, B, C, and D that satisfy this, other than everything being zero, there are an infinite number of vectors that satisfy these restrictions. And we can probably do that. A is one, B is one, C is two, D is zero. That should do it, I think. So that's a pretty cut classic application of these null spaces. Uh, with that, I think I'm going to let you go. It was a brief lesson, but I guess sometimes that happens.